Hello, and welcome back to Ashley Made Makes. Today, I am finally finishing the Coquilico, Coquilico, Coquilico skirt from Wildflower Designs patterns. This is a retro inspired skirt with large 18th century pockets. It comes in a waist size range from 25 and a half inches to 54 and a half inches and it's broken up into a few inch groupings because it is so adjustable. And there's two views. One view is basically a half circle skirt with a D-ring holding the back and the front around so it's highly adjustable. I'll show some photos in here as we go because this is really hard to explain. The second view is an even fuller skirt so it's basically a double half circle skirt which is what I'll be making with sort of a lace-up system. What I decided to do was make uh, basically the double circle half circle skirt with the view a d ring just because i thought that would be a lot more comfortable for me while i was sitting down and the pattern designer totally encouraged this so it works out really fine so full disclosure i started out on the pattern testing group for this this was my first time pattern testing and she is also a new pattern designer which probably wasn't the best combination now there were several issues that came up as we were testing this mostly in the larger sizes and several adjustments were made to those waistband pieces that are the main kind of interesting part of this skirt pattern and unfortunately the timing got extended where it ended up being in conflict with a work project that I had going on so I didn't finish it and I was feeling really kind of sad about it. Ultimately I think the pattern designer here made a lot of good decisions. Basically what happened with finding those waistband differences and those details, she came to the conclusion that she needed a larger size block which I think is the correct conclusion that most designers should come to and I think it's a hallmark of a really good pattern. Some of the things that happen when you try and stretch a small block to a larger body and it just doesn't work. There's things like wearing ease and details that don't match up, lengths of arms, lengths of arm size. These are all details that can be corrected by having a larger starting point. So I always think this is the best decision for designers to make. And that's why sometimes you get some weirdness in larger sizes of patterns where they've stretched them and things don't work anymore. Other decisions that she ended up making were things like expanding the pockets so that there's a range of sizes on the pocket and it's just not a static detail. I think things like this make a big difference because you want to scale up all those details for them to make sense on a larger size. So to me these are all just things to look out for on a good pattern and things I generally try and look out for when I'm going to make something and which pattern I decide to ultimately use. This is why it's really important to have representation, to see people of different sizes making garments, showing how these details work out. One vivid one I remember recently where she made the largest size and just the wearing ease. I'll show that picture up here. It's hilarious. So this is kind of like some of the flaws of not doing a larger block. And so I think this gal has done a great thing in making a larger block it just meant that I personally ran out of time. So a year now, I am finally gonna finish this. So to get started, I have just sewn all the fronts and backs together and then I have ironed it flat and then just trimmed it again, nice and straight because being that's linen, it frays pretty fast. And obviously this has been rattling around a box for a few months, so it was a bit of a mess. That's a lot nicer. And now it's ready for me to apply binding to all my seams. This is a big roll from Amazon that I got. Um, it's not the best quality in the world, but it'll work. And I like the cream. It adds to the sort of historical -ness. Um, And the only change I'm really making is I'm going to be outlining the pockets with the binding as well. Um, in the pattern instructions, it has you finish this edge and then turn them inside out um, and I find that that really bothers me. I don't like having the flicky edges inside the pocket um, so what I'm gonna do is just bind the whole outside and also this 
lippy opening and I'll show you that when I get there. All right, so I have the front of the pocket here with the slit cut in it. And then I just have a piece of my binding and I just cut a little, like a little notch out of it and I've pinned that right where the end of my slit is. And so I'm gonna spin this so that I can line this up, just the first side to sew along here. I should pin that a bit different. And then like my side seams, I'm gonna just pin this so that it'll stay. We're gonna kind of like fold this. You can see how this is folded to make that flat. So I'm just gonna stitch that down all the way along there. And then we'll flip it over to the other side and I'll show you that when we get there. But so then it closes like that with like as minimal bunching as we can manage. Okay, so I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that, but basically that slit is too right to the point there. Not perfect, but pretty damn close. Take out this excess pin. You didn't see that. No one saw me stitching over my pins. And then I'm just gonna fold this over. Yeah, that looks good. I'm just gonna fire down the other side. I want to stitch as close to the edge of this binding here as you can manage. It takes a bit of practice. So again, I'm gonna move all this this way. So we're creating a straight line. Might just throw a back tack in there actually. So I get over this curve. Make me feel better. Okay. So sailing. Just gonna cut off that extra. Yeah, so you can see that looks pretty clean now. Obviously it sticks out basically the thickness of the binding because this binding's pretty hefty. Um, but it's not buckling the fabric at all when I go to overlap it a little bit at the top here, like the pattern has you do. So, and then it sits relatively flat. The only poking is here. So I think that looks really quite good. Um, there's no like puckering along here. So yeah, I think that's the trickiest part of the pattern, honestly. All right, so I have all the waistband pieces here. Um, but I didn't interface any of them, which is slightly annoying. Um, this one I know is the back because this is the only piece I pieced which I think turned out really well. I don't think you can really tell at all, um, just to try and save on fabric. So I know that one's the back, but... Uh I have no memory of this place. Uh, I have some sort of mark here, but I have no idea what that means. So thanks, past me. Also, I didn't interface any of these, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So I have a bunch of woven interfacing, which is what I'm gonna use to interface these pieces. Woven interfacing is great and is basically all I use 
um, cause it doesn't have that shreddy quality that traditional interfacing has. And it's like really quite sturdy. So this is what I'm going to go with in this like wadded up ball. I think I've got enough and uh, we're going to figure out what piece is what. This is definitely a do as I say, not as I do moments where you can learn from my mistakes. But this definitely isn't as bad as I thought. So at least with this pattern, it's clearly marked which ones are view A, which is what I'm doing strictly for the waistband. So I have the back waistband, which we already determined because um, it's actually like the most unique piece and that's the one that I have pieced together. I actually actually marked it with a B so that's helpful. So I know that's there. Um, I do need to cut one out of interfacing it says there. So I'm just gonna put that one there. And then this mysterious piece I'm pretty sure is actually the front waistband. So I'm just matching that up. Um, one thing I will say, there's no notches or anything on this front waistband really distinguishing it. Uh, I did mark it with an F on here, so I wasn't totally crazy. Again, definitely gonna cut it out of interfacing. So at least I figured that out. I have these smaller pieces. I think these are the ring loops. Yes. Um, and I only, I have two of them for some reason. I must have been losing it a little bit or I was cutting two of everything else. So I cut these on the fold. So I have a spare, scrap, whatever. I'm gonna throw that over there. And did I mark these in any capacity? No, I don't wanna have it marked on any capacity. No. So this is where it's like kind of important. This is a hard color to mark on just because neither the purple nor the blue shows up very well in terms of disappearing ink, which is what I normally use to mark. Um, so this would have been a situation where I could have used a post-it or something to mark it. Um, looks like I did use some red pen just in the seam allowances. I don't know what that was supposed to mean. Maybe it's supposed to mean L for loop. Is that what that is? I'm gonna leave that there, L for loop. And do I need interfacing? So she says interfacing optional, optional for lightweight fabrics. So probably for me, because this is linen and it is sort of shifty. And I think when it comes out of the wash, it's gonna be all crumply and stuff. And I mean, like normally I pull it out and let it hang when it's hot and gets rid of most of the wrinkles. So since that's sort of my preferred method, I'm probably gonna interface all of these just to keep it from like turning into like just a super ball. So that's that spare tie. And so that leaves these, which I've cut four of. Shifty linen, you wanna make sure you mark it really well so that you're lining everything up in the right place before it gets like moved around and stretched out and it's one of the ways of maintaining the pattern. So this one I did mark with that red pen in the seam allowance. Um, that will always be there, but you won't see it once it's assembled, so that's good. So that is the back. We have ties, loops, and front. One nice feature of this pattern, which isn't included in every pattern, is that the seam allowances are actually marked on the pattern pieces kind of faintly. And this is actually really great because it shows you exactly where your interfacing needs to be. It's good to cut your interfacing away from your seam allowances just to reduce the amount of bulk in them when you're assembling. And that'll give you a really nice flat result. So even if this isn't marked, that would something I would recommend, but this is really nice, um, especially because the construction of this has you fold over the waistbands. All right, so I just ironed these on and I just kind of wanted to show you what this would look like when it was finished with the interfacing on here. These are nice and secure now, that's not going anywhere. And you can see what I mean where it's outside the seam allowance all the way along. All right, welcome back. So, I've actually had this just hanging out for the last couple of weeks. I've actually been quite sick, but 
damn it all if I'm not going to finish. So I have the front and the back still as two separate pieces and I have all the binding done. So I think actually I'm going to go ahead and hem it, which seems a little ass backwards. Um, I haven't attached the waistband yet. The next piece after adding the waistband is to hem it. Um, and I think it will actually be a lot nicer if I can fold this binding over the hem to finish it and it'll actually make it quite a bit stronger. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do that instead because um, I don't think it's going to affect it that much. I'm going to try and be careful when I put the waistband on um, that it's even, but yeah, it should have already stretched out as much as it's going to. I unfortunately did not um, stay stitch the top of these pieces here. I have now realized past Ashley did not stay stitch the top of the pieces, which is generally um, good practice for a circle skirt because they can stretch out. Thankfully, I'm making the view that's gathered, so it shouldn't, it really won't matter that much because um, I'm just gathering it down. If I was making the straight view, it would have been really important to stay stitch along here. So other issues with finishing projects months later. But yeah, and I'm going to be using a really fun hem technique, so we'll have a look at that. All right. So that took an eon, but I have a ton of binding now. I am probably going to cover this in another video. I have another video idea coming up, um, and I think it'll be really good to explain this in that video. But needless to say you're probably gonna see white hem facings for a while. So right side to right side. Probably gonna pin this just behind this so that this will fold onto this later and not create a bunch of extra bulk. And that's it. So um, I'm not gonna measure it out anything. I'm just gonna work off this sort of giant spool so that I can stretch as I go. Why aren't you lining up? So I'm gonna wanna kind of gently stretch this as I go along because it is on the bias but while not stretching the underneath so that when I go to fold this over this width stays nice and smooth which I'm fair if you've worked with knits like you're fairly used to this this sort of idea of stretching the top it's like similar to like how you would put in a neckline where you gently stretch one to meet the other and see that kind of action. So I always have it like split where my top two fingers can pinch lightly and then my bottom is just like holding it in place. So you end up with like stretching it along which gives you that nice curve. And I've got this so that I'm sewing it at five eighths like I normally would. I think for me that's the easiest so I don't forget to be honest just because that's the way I learned. But you could definitely do this smaller. I would recommend a bigger seam allowance for for linen though just because even though this is encased you know it might it might fray within the seam allowance so it's just good to have a bit of a seam allowance on linen in my opinion all right so i've got this all attached and then ironed nice and flat. So I'm just gonna do some understitching here. This seems like it has been more of an exercise in ironing than it has been anything else, to be honest, but here we go. So I'm gonna use just the side of the foot as my mark here. And I'm still using my white threads so that this matches. Have everything ironed now on that hem facing and I've just done a little test here I thought I would try out my blind hem foot and blind hem stitch just because I find I'm been really hard on my skirts I don't know what it is but I sit on them wrong or something happens and I manage to drop the hem uh, in some capacity and then I have to hand stitch it up again and it's a whole thing and I hate doing it with these giant circle skirts because it just takes forever and I hate hand sewing, all the things. So I have this scrap here and I was experimenting with seeing how this works, which it's fine, except the larger end of your project is in the throat bed here. So that's quite annoying. And the way this casts is it's just off to the left of this seam. So I'll probably have to like roll this to make this fit 
through here. But yeah, I think I'm gonna give this a go with this facing. This seems very backwards, but um, here is that hem facing put on an iron, and then that's the right side of the project there. So what you're supposed to do is flip this like this and line this fold up with this flange on this hem foot, like so. And you're supposed to leave about a quarter of an inch exposed. Obviously this is a little bit over too, so it makes it about an eighth of an inch or so in practice. And I folded under about half an inch just to be safe all the way along this hem facing. So we're gonna give that a go. Oh, I didn't know if I showed you. So I have white on my bobbin and then green on the top so that um, the green will match the outside of this and then the white bobbin will go on here underneath so you won't see it. This is a new practice for me. You can see it nips into the other fabric. This is just so awkward. It feels so backwards having the large part of my project in the throat. See that now? There's just a little bit of a crease now from where I folded it. But overall, I think that looks really good and really smooth. Again, feels like just an exercise in ironing. Oh yeah, that's gonna be really nice. Yeah, you can barely see those prick stitches all the way along. So I'd say that works. The only reason I think you could see it a bit is because I've got this darker thread here, but it's really hard because this is made up of basically white and green and gold threads to make this color. It's not like a solid color. So I was trying to match as best as I could those kind of green threads, but you can really barely see that. I don't even know if you'll be able to see it on camera. I think that's gonna be really elegant. And like I say, especially once it goes through the wash a couple times and the linen softens. On the back, you can see a touch of green pricks just at the corner there. It doesn't bother me too much, you know, it's a hem. But uh, again, once it goes through the wash a couple of times, but it still stayed really smooth, which was my main concern about not hand sewing it. So, you know, this facing technique works really well. And it's just like, look at the drape on that. I'm like starting to get really excited about this project now that it's starting to come together a bit. So. I have set these wrong side to wrong side and then basted all the way around and then just trimmed it up. So it was nice and even, ready to put my binding on. I have the machine loaded with cream again. So apparently we're just destined to switch back and forth on thread and I'm just gonna bind all around the bottom of the pocket and up the one side because this is gonna be in the waistband of course and then this is going to be behind the other seam allowances and I'll trim that down. I'll show you what I'm doing about that later. Like I say I always like to have it like a little bit over the edge here just to make it easier so that the binding doesn't get eaten by the foot. So I have my pocket all bound and I have it pinned to the side of the skirt piece here and then because I've ended up folding this binding over to capture that hem, um, it doesn't quite match up with the pocket so I'm trying to have the pocket just stick over that so I've got it pinned and then I put my blind hem foot, stitch in the ditch foot, whatever this is back on my machine and I'm just gonna line it up with the edge of the binding here and I'm gonna use that to stitch along the binding to attach the pocket and then I'm gonna trim this allowance down quite a bit and fold this over and then we're gonna encase it again back at it so I have this ironed again so I trimmed down that seam allowance and then I've ironed this other one over top that's got the binding on it instead of stitching like super close I'm gonna stitch basically to that edge over the binding just to encase that other seam stitching super close is what you'd normally do so since I had those skirt panels all assembled, I went ahead and gathered them and attached all my various waistband pieces together. But then I've had a total minute of confusion here just with this waistband. This is the trickiest part of this pattern for sure, just with its assembly. But um, so it turns out there is like two different sides. So this is actually the side that the 
extra D-ring tie goes on. And this is the side that sticks out the pattern. So I went ahead and made sure I remarked this whole thing and obviously unattached it from my tie so that I made sure that this lines up with my pocket in the front here and then that'll stick off and then this is going to be the room for that d-ring which we'll get into here in a bit but 10 points for marking the pattern everybody makes mistakes joy of joys so now that i figured it out i think we're good to go i am going to attempt to assemble and we'll come back all right checking in again have this all assembled now and then i've ironed this seam allowance in which is really nice that was easy because of the way the interfacing is and then i'm just ironing it down over to match my line of stitching and then i am gonna be a good girl and hand sew this like it tells me to even though i don't want to but i think it'll be a nice finish i'm gonna go ahead and assemble the front and then i'm gonna sit and do all the hand stitching and then we get very close to putting the panels together finally all right so i wasn't going to show this but i thought this is actually a kind of useful and interesting technique that the pattern has you do so what it has you do is actually sew this like this by machine and then turn it out and then the only part you're hand stitching then is actually to the waistband itself you get that sort of strength and you save yourself the hand sewing of the ties altogether. i don't know if that's that much faster really um just because you have to turn these out and it's kind of painful but what i'm actually going to be doing is putting a safety pin here on the end on the outside and then stitching it together so then I have something to push back through to turn it out. This is so long, something like a chopstick is going to be really painful to help turn it out. So the other weird thing, just as a side note, is that as you do one seam allowance at 3 8 and one at 5 8 I might be mistaken, but that does look like what it is on the rest of the waistband. So that's a bit weird. I think I might adjust that for next time to make them both 5 8 because I've ironed them in so I can actually see them and then match them up like that. Um, so you see that bit of an edge there like I mean it doesn't affect anything really it's just more like annoying in practice to do one at have a random seam allowance at three eighths for no reason so eh might adjust it in the future all right so I have all of that nicely hand sewn down now and I've just attached the nice gold d-rings I got to match my sparkly fabric and I'm just gonna sew that right along there and then we'll do the sides all right last thing to do is just to connect the front and the back. So I'm just going to stitch right along the seam that I created by folding back the binding and we're done. Yay! In conclusion, I am really happy with this skirt, but mostly I'm just proud I finished it. I often find it's really hard for me once I set something down and lose interest in it to pick it back up again and finish it. Even with all the waistband piece setbacks and mishaps sitting it down and figuring it out and it really wasn't that hard to get it done i am really happy with the level of finishing i did on this skirt just with its adjustability i think i'll get a lot of wear out of it and it's going to last a long time despite it really not being an everyday skirt with the gold lurex it does really make me feel like a Disney princess and was well worth it. Of note that I didn't mention was I did only end up using five yards of 45 inch wide fabric for this, which is a lot less than the seven plus the pattern suggested. And I only ended up piecing the back waistband. So do with that what you will. This turned into more of a walkthrough than anything, but I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of trying to finish something and I hope it inspires you. So... Is there anything you're trying to finish off for the new year? What UFOs do you have sitting around your studio? I'd really love to know. I'm always fascinated on why particular things end up sitting around for a really long time and we just don't finish them. Um, please hit that like button and subscribe down below. I'd really appreciate it. I'm trying to hit 100 subscribers to be able to unlock a lot of the features of YouTube and really get my channel out there. So I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!